I think you have a notebook that has the notes that you can use to uh, to follow along. I want to obviously the focus of of all of our sessions is going to be uh, the gospel. Uh, but what I want to do in this first session is tell you a little bit of, of my own story and how I came upon understanding the power of the gospel and the centrality of the gospel in the lives of, of believers. Um, I, I was raised in a Christian home and uh, my, my family uh, was a church going family. Every time the doors of the church were open, my family was there. And um, uh, so I heard the gospel, I heard the Bible taught all my life in church, and, and then even at home we had family worship each night, and I heard the word of God uh, taught uh, by my parents. And so while I uh, understood the Bible to some degree and understood the gospel to a significant degree, uh, my problem was that I, I didn't quite understand how the gospel applied to me once I became a believer in Jesus. I had a deficient view of the doctrine of justification. Um, and I think if you would have asked me, I mean, I, I went uh, to a Bible college and I was a Bible major and then went to seminary and then even taught uh, as an associate professor at the master seminary. And so I learned a lot, you know, over the years and was involved in preaching and, and teaching. And yet I would have to admit that I had a deficient view of the doctrine of justification, one of the central doctrines of the Christian faith. And I, I think if you would have asked me, uh, you know, to define the doctrine of justification, I would have probably defined it accurately. But my problem was that I, I didn't understand the mechanics of how it impacted the way that God related to me and the way that I was to relate to God. I didn't understand the mechanics of how to live in sight of the good favor of God toward me now that I'm a justified believer in Christ. I made a number of I don't know what expression you use here. I made a number of professions of faith uh, throughout uh, my life uh, where I would pray and ask Christ to save me. And the first profession of faith that I made was when I was four and a half years old. And a few months after that, I was baptized. I was baptized right around the age of uh, five years uh, of age. Um, and, um, but obviously as I began to grow older, I, I realized I'm really not a Christian because there was so much sin that was in my life. And so when I was about 14 years of age, I was attending a Christian high school and I became overwhelmed with the thought of the length of eternity. And I don't know why and where that came from other than from the Lord, but I was just seized with the overwhelming thought of how long eternity is and the fact that I'm going to live somewhere forever. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, if I died, I would be not spending eternity in heaven. So I went to my Bible professor at my Christian high school and said, I don't think I'm saved and can you help me? And so he shared the gospel with me and I prayed what we call the sinner's prayer and I asked Christ to, uh, to save me. And after I did that, um, um, I went to my pastor and I, I said to my pastor, I want to be baptized. Now, I had already been baptized at the age of five, but I didn't think I was really saved then. So I said, I think I'm really saved now. Will you baptize me? And so he said, sure. And so I got baptized uh, a few weeks after I had uh, prayed at the age of 14. And after that point, it seemed like everything was going really well. And I think I was seeing fruit of my salvation. I was spending time in the word every day. I was 
I was praying, I was abstaining from besetting uh, sins, uh, and occasionally, you know, I would mess up, I would sin, but God seemed happy enough to forgive me of my sins. But eventually, as the weeks wore on, it seemed like the sheer quantity of times that I failed reached a threshold where I began to sense that God was getting fed up with forgiving me. Uh, and I felt myself gradually falling outside of God's good uh, favor. And so it was after a, a few weeks of living like that and then feeling like I was falling out of God's good favor, that I was not performing at the level that I should be as a Christian, that I just gave up and I went back to living the way that I was uh, before. Uh, and so it wasn't more than maybe two or three months after I had prayed at the age of 14 for Christ to save me and after I had been baptized that I began to conclude I'm not really saved after all uh, because I'm not seeing any difference in my life. My junior year of high school, uh, so when I was about 17 years of age, I went after that year of school, I went to a summer camp and it was a Christian camp and I heard the gospel being preached every day of the week at this camp. And I just became very impacted by the truth of the gospel. It was, it was, it was being preached and I was realizing I'm not saved. Uh, and uh, at the end of the week, they gave us the opportunity if we were not saved to you know, commit our lives to the Lord and obtain salvation. And they did it in a little bit different of a way. They had a big campfire uh, at the end of the camp and they had a five gallon bucket of sticks. And the leader of this camp told us, he said, if you want to be saved and surrender your life to Christ, just come up here to this bucket and grab one of the sticks. And this stick you grab represents you and your life. And then come over with that stick to the fire and throw that in the fire. And that represents the full surrender of your life to Jesus Christ. And I thought to myself, man, I want to do that. Uh, so I went up and I, I got a stick and I looked at that stick and I knew that represented me. And I, I threw that stick into the fire. And the cry of my heart as I did that was, dear God, save me, save my soul. And so I prayed that prayer through the stick in the fire and, um, and I was so happy coming home from camp. It was a 500 mile journey back from camp to our hometown. And I was just, uh, riding on air. I was so excited to be a true Christian now. And I felt an exploding love in my heart for the Lord. And I came back from, from camp and the first Sunday, that I was back at church, I went to my pastor again. And I, I said, Pastor, uh, I need you to baptize me because I, I think I really got saved this time. And, um, and that would have made my third time being baptized. And to his credit, he said, no, I'm not going to baptize you again. And, and that's to his credit because had he baptized me again, I'm convinced he would have baptized me three or four or five more times after that. Um, because even after that, for several weeks, things were going great. And I was in the word every day. I was loving God. I was praying every day, uh, trying to share the gospel with other people. And I was seeing that my performance was different. Uh, and I was abstaining from besetting sins. And I was excited about all of that. But then eventually, as the weeks and months wore on, I again began to feel like the sheer quantity of times that I sinned and failed God reached a threshold where God was growing fed up with me again and tired of forgiving me again. And I felt myself gradually falling out of God's uh, good uh, favor. You see, I knew growing up how to be saved. Trust me, I knew how to be saved. I knew how to pray the prayer, the sinner's prayer. I literally, I just mentioned a few times in which I prayed and asked Christ to save me, but I, I don't think it would be an overstatement to say that I prayed that prayer for salvation maybe a hundred times growing up in my Christian home. I remember our family would go to uh, Amarillo, Texas, 
uh, to visit family um, every every summer. And if any, you guys know where Amarillo, Texas is? It's it's in the southern United States. Uh, you know where Texas is, maybe? Okay, uh, it's it's in Texas. And but I remember as a kid lying in bed at night. Um, and they would have real strong winds in Amarillo. And I remember lying in bed at night as a kid and I would hear the howling Texas windstorms just beating and moaning against the house and uh, with kind of a siren haunting type of sound. And I would feel alarmed in my spirit hearing those sounds. And the thought that would come to my mind as a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old is, what if the rapture came and I'm left behind here in Amarillo, a thousand miles away from home? And I'm telling you, I did not want to be left behind in Texas. If the rapture came, I, I did not want to be in Texas when the rapture came. So I wanted to make sure that I was saved. So I'd lying in bed, I would pray and ask Christ to save me just to be sure. And after I would pray those kinds of prayers, the next day I would think that I was seeing a difference in my life. But eventually, again, the sheer quantity of times that I failed God would reach a point where I just felt like God was fed up with me and that that he was growing weary of forgiving me of my my sins. And I noticed that over the years of my life, even 10 years into my ministry as a pastor of Cornerstone Fellowship Bible Church, I noticed that when I would try to walk with God, that I would become obsessive over every detail of my life. And it was an exasperating, exhausting exercise to try to please God and to stay in God's good favor. And I noticed that I was actually most irritable as a person when I was trying to walk with God trying to make sure that God was staying favorably disposed toward me. If I wasn't trying to walk with the Lord, I, I was a pretty easygoing person. But when I tried to walk with God and stay in his good favor, I would become almost obsessive. And I would be very irritable because I was just exhausted from having to tend to my standing with, with God. And so this is kind of how I, I live my life um, all the way, you know, through college and through seminary and then the first 10 years of my ministry as a pastor. But about 14, 15 years ago, um, I had committed my life to the Lord afresh and was in a really good, rich season of renewal in my relationship with the Lord, but I noticed that that same old wearisome agitation began to come over me again uh, after a few months of of really working hard at staying in the good favor of God. And I'll try to make this short, but I was driving home from work as a pastor uh, about the third or fourth week of this season of renewal, and it's about a 10-minute drive home from work, and I got most of the way home from work, and I, on my route home, I, I guess my mind had wandered and for about 10 minutes and was thinking about something else. And when my mind came back to the Lord, I instantly began to worry, like, what have I been thinking about over the last 10 minutes? And have I been thinking about anything sinful? Because if I have, I need to make sure I confess that to the Lord and, you know, to ensure that things are okay between him and, uh, and me. And I felt myself just wincing under the Lord's gaze. And I was asking, Lord, are we okay? And I'm retracing my steps over the previous 10 minutes to figure out what I had been thinking about to know if I had to make anything right with him. And, and in that moment, um, I, I just felt overwhelmingly exhausted at the thought of spending the rest of my life having to tend so obsessively to my relationship with God in this way to keep him favorably disposed toward me. And I felt literally a manic urge to just trash the whole effort. And in my heart, I screamed. I just like, I cannot keep living like this. And I began singing the song, uh, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I began to sing that song 
uh, all the while I was frustrated at how far my own experience was from the rest of that songwriter who wrote that song. When I got home from work, my family was not at home, so I grabbed my Bible and I opened my Bible to, of all places, Romans chapter 5. I don't even know what led me there, but I opened it up to Romans 5 and I began pacing the floor in my living room as I read Romans chapter 5 out loud. Um, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And on the chapter went, and I began to read that chapter out loud as I paced the floor in my living room. And as I did so, I I realized that I am reading the inspired ravings of a man who's in a state of worship over his justification. And something about justification hit me in that moment that I had never realized before. And that is that I realized that if I am a justified believer in Jesus, that means that I am under God's favor all day, every day, good days and bad days, waking and sleeping solely based on the performance of Jesus and not my performance. And as I realized that, a spirit of rest began to come over Me And I realize all of my life, I would have never said it this way, but I've been obsessing over my justification when in fact, based on this chapter, Jesus has already obsessed over that for me and has tended to that. In Romans 5, I realize that I am seeing a man who's resting in his accomplished justification and I'm wrestling over it. I'm agitating over my justification and he is rejoicing and exulting in it. And so on that day, uh, about 14, 15 years ago, the reality of my justification began to sink in. Uh, but then I noticed in the days that followed how easily the, my grasp of my justification could slip from my consciousness. And I would easily fall back into a works mentality to where it was up to me to maintain my gracious standing before God. And so I pulled out a three by five card and I started writing out some basic truths regarding my justification on that card. And whenever I found myself struggling or going back into a performance mentality, I would pull out that card on my good days and on my bad days, sometimes several times a day. And I would read those truths about my justification. And whenever I did so, I felt like I was a thirsty man drinking a tall glass of water in the desert. Well, that three by five card turned into the front side of a half sheet of paper. And then it turned into the front front and back of a half sheet of paper. And then that turned into the gospel primer uh, as it just built uh, week by week and month by month. And what's in the gospel primer essentially is a summation of what I began during those days to preach to myself every day in order to stay mindful of the grace of God and that it's all about Jesus and his performance and it's not about me and my performance. Now, as I did that, It did not make me apathetic about my own pursuit of holiness. In fact, I found that the more I believed in the reality of my justification in Christ, uh, the more I found myself having tremendous amounts of energy to put into pursuing holiness and enjoying God and ministering his amazing grace to other people. And I began to realize the reason I didn't really have as much energy to pursue holiness before is because so much of my energy was consumed with tending to my justification when in fact Christ has already tended to that for me but now 
I could set that aside knowing I'm justified and it's all because of Jesus and his performance and not mine. So that's taken care of. I can now just live in the good of that. And I found myself having a ton of energy left over now to enjoy God, minister to other people and pursue holiness. And here's what I began to notice. I began to notice myself changing and growing uh, and loving God more than ever, loving holiness more than uh, than ever. I remember one, one day I was at the house by myself and the television was on and a commercial came on that had images that I knew that I should not look at. Uh, and I just instinctively got up from the room and walked into our kitchen to get away from the TV. And there was nobody in the house to see what I would have done or not done. But I, I walked from that room into the kitchen and then it hit me what I had just done. I hadn't even thought about it. I just turned and walked away from sin. And I'm standing in the kitchen going, what just happened here? It's like, I just walked away from sin. And the reason is, is because of the power of the gospel and my love for God that is fueled by an awareness of the good of the gospel and the grace of God that he has rendered towards me. In my moments of temptation, when I would be tempted to sin, I found myself enjoying this line of thought. I would say, you know what? I can commit this sin. This sin that is commending itself to me right now, I can commit this sin right now and God's grace would abound to me all the more as he graciously maintains my justified status as a believer. But then I would say, but it's precisely for this reason that I choose not to commit this sin. And I would turn and walk away from the sin with laughter in my heart. That's the line of thinking that I found so powerful. And only someone who's been regenerated can understand why that is so powerful. The doctrine of justification has come to mean so much to me. Uh, and it's not all that the gospel is about, but as John Piper says, it is the heart of the gospel. And if you don't get this one doctrine of your justification in Christ, everything else in your Christian life is not going to work. Your worship, your pursuit of holiness, your sanctification, all of that is going to go haywire if you don't have a robust and a strong understanding of the doctrine of justification. So what I want to do with the time that we have tonight is just to go over with you five truths that you see in your notes regarding justification that every believer should understand. And this is not only for your benefit, but as you disciple other people and minister to them, you want to make sure that they understand justification. It's a... A very important part of the gospel. And you can fill in the blank here. Truth number one is that justification by faith is a very big deal. And it is worthy of our diligent study. If you're looking for a topic to research and study in order to understand the gospel better, choose this doctrine of justification. Um, in my own life as a believer, I just was not interested in this doctrine all that much. It sort of seemed like a legal technicality to me. Uh, but I realize now that there is treasure and abundance inside of the doctrine of justification. In fact, I don't think this is in your notes, but John Calvin said justification by faith is the hinge upon which swings true religion. Justification by faith is the hinge upon which swings true religion. John Piper says that justification by faith is the heart of the gospel. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. And by the way, when he says that, he's not just saying that I'm not ashamed to preach it to other people. He's also saying, I'm not ashamed to believe it. I'm not ashamed to believe that the gospel is true for me. Yes, I, um, I'm responsible for the death of Christians. There are widows 
and orphans in the church today as a result of decisions I made before Christ saved me. I have passed sins that haunt me to this day, Paul would say. But you know what? In spite of the fact that I was a violent aggressor and a sinner against Christ, I am not ashamed to believe that the gospel is true for me. And I'm also not ashamed to preach it to other people. Now, why is he not ashamed? Look what he says. For it is the power of God into salvation to everyone who is believing. And we'll talk more about the power of God in the next uh, session. But he's saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel to believe it and preach it. Why? Because it is the power of God into salvation to everyone who is believing to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it's the power of God. If you then said to Paul, why is the gospel the power of God? Paul would say, I could give you many reasons and many answers to that question, but let me give you one. And here's the first thing out of his mouth in verse 17. For, here's why it's the power of God. Here's why the gospel is crackling with the power of God. For in it, in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God. And you might want to underline that word righteousness. That's the Greek word that is translated justification. For in it, the justification that comes from God is revealed from faith to faith. The doctrine of justification is the first thing Paul mentions by way of explaining why the gospel is so powerful. And so we're not surprised as you read the book of Romans, uh, the first section of Romans, many of you know this, is all about developing the doctrine of sin, right? Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 20 is all about developing the doctrine of sin. But then starting in Romans 3, 21, Paul begins to unfold the gospel. And guess what? He begins to talk about justification throughout the rest of Romans three verses 21 through 31. It's all about justification and Romans four verses one through 25. The entire chapter is all about justification. Romans five verses one through 21 is all about the doctrine of justification. Guys, here is Paul explaining the gospel to Christian people. And at the beginning of his gospel presentation, he literally spends 57 verses doing nothing but explaining the doctrine of justification to Christian people. And some of them may have been listening to him saying, Paul, hurry up and get through this so we can get onto this sanctification stuff. Tell me how to live. Give me the list the things I need to do, the do's and don'ts. And Paul's like, no, we're going to spend 57 verses and I'm going to talk to you about justification because you have to get this right. And Paul spends these verses talking about justification before he even touches sanctification, before he even delivers a single command. He talks about justification, why it's needed, how it is brought about, the mechanics of it as well as the blissful, happy consequences of being justified in in Christ. And so as you read the book of Romans and come to, to those 57 verses, don't skip over them. Don't rush through them. In my early days, that's exactly what I did. I skipped over those verses. I rushed through them so that I could get to the list of the do's and don'ts. I was always a list person. Just give me the list, Lord, of what I need to do. And I tried to do sanctification without a solid understanding of my justification. And it was a disaster. Uh, The thinking of many believers uh, in the church today is their thinking may be, I think I understand justification, but they actually have a shallow understanding of it. Uh, But Their thought may be, I may not understand everything about it, but I'm glad it's done. And I think it's something God took care of um, and he's already dealt with. So I'm just going to open my Bible and I'm not going to study that. I'm going to study the list and I'm going to open my Bible and say, "Okay, Lord, give me the rules to live by. 
And I'm telling you that if you don't understand your justification and you try to do sanctification in a way that's not plugged into an understanding of your justification, your sanctification will go haywire. It will not work. Our sanctification is fueled by and governed by this fundamental heart of the gospel reality of our justification. Listen to what Martin Luther says, and I believe this is in your notes. He says, when the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen. Now he's talking about the church, ecclesiology, Christendom as a whole. Um, but he would happily apply this to our individual lives as well. I would apply this. This is what happened in my own life. Think about this from the standpoint of your own life. When the article of justification has fallen from your consciousness, from your faith and your appreciation, everything has fallen. Therefore, it is necessary constantly to repetitiously teach and impress it as Moses says of his law. For it, the doctrine of justification cannot be repeatedly taught and urged enough or too much. He's saying you can never teach on the doctrine of justification too much. Martin Luther also said the article of justification must be learned diligently. You must. And that's why in his preaching ministry, he preached on justification all the time. And he said, I feel like I'm, I'm banging it about the heads of my congregation, beating it into their skull. Because to think this way as a justified believer that it's all about Christ and not me, it's his performance and not my performance, that is so unnatural to think that way that we lose it in a heartbeat if we're not careful. And then when we lose that, the whole house of cards collapses. Martin Lloyd-Jones says they, speaking of Christians, often concentrate on the question of sanctification, but it does not help them because they have not understood justification. So we cannot do sanctification without an understanding of our justification. So that brings us to a second truth, and I'm going to define justification in just a moment, and you'll understand why this is such an amazing doctrine. But this justification, whatever it is, and we'll define it in a moment, comes to us through Jesus Christ and by faith in Him alone. It comes to us through Jesus Christ and by faith in Him alone. Alone, Paul says in Romans 5.1, having been justified by what? By faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You may say, hey, but my, my faith is weak. That doesn't matter. Uh, Abraham was justified by faith, right? In Genesis 15, read the next few chapters after he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Read about his behavior after that moment of faith and justification and you'll see how weak his faith was at the beginning. And it became strong over time. doesn't matter whether your faith is weak or strong or whether it is new or old. We are justified by faith. And this is rather than works, rather than your performance. You are justified by faith rather than by your performance. In Romans 3, verse 21, Paul says, but now apart from the law, in other words, apart from obedience to the law, to the Ten Commandments, the righteousness, and that's the same word translated justification, the justification that comes from God has been manifested Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verse 5, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. See, it's not, we don't have to do any work to get this. This generation ought to love this concept. You don't have to work. You don't have to do anything to get this. All you got to do is realize your bankruptcy and look at Jesus and the fact that he did all that work of living a perfectly righteous life and declare your bankruptcy and believe in him and justification comes to you by virtue of faith 
in him. You think of Jesus and and the Gospel of Luke talks about a tax collector who came to the temple and he was so broken down over his sin, he wouldn't even come near the temple. He was so broken down, he wouldn't even look up into heaven. His head was bowed and he's beating his breast. And the only thing that could come out of his mouth was literally, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus says, the man went home righteous. He went home justified. He did no work other than acknowledging his bankruptcy and asking for salvation from God, obviously believing in him without any works. We know that man went home and and did good works. But before he had done a single good work, he was justified. Now, what is justification? I think there's a definition in your notes. This is from Wayne Grudem, who is a... Um, a solid theologian on a number of issues, especially when it comes to salvation. And here's how he defines justification. He says, justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which he does two things. Number one, decides to think of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. And number two, declares us to be righteous in his sight. So let me have you underline the word think under number one. He decides to think of our sins as forgiven as Christ's righteousness as belonging to us. That word think alerts us to something very profound about justification. It alerts us to the fact that justification is something that happens in the mind of God. If you want to know the location of justification, It's the mind of God. It goes to the issue of how God now thinks about us. Okay? Justification is not something that happens inside of me. That's the Roman Catholic doctrine of the infusion of righteousness into us. But a biblical understanding of this doctrine is that the location in which justification happens is inside the mind of God. And it goes to the issue of how God now sees us and thinks about us. Is that a big deal to you? That's huge. How God thinks about us. And number two, he declares us to be righteous in his sight. In other words, he audibilizes. He speaks that decision. We're not left to guess. God doesn't expect us to be mind readers. He speaks it out loud. He says, I want you to know exactly how I think about you from now on, that I will think about you with your sins forgiven and you clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. I audibilize that. I speak that to you so that you know my mind when it comes to how I see you. And by the way, if you read Romans 5, you see the language of abounding a lot. Uh, several times in that chapter, which teaches us that when God declares us righteous, that's not a reluctant declaration where we come to him with all of our sin mess and say, God, forgive me and save me. And God's like, well, I, I guess you, uh, you did everything I said that you should do. I'm not really happy about this, but I'm bound by my promises that I have to justify you. All right, you're justified. It's not that. Uh, the declaration of our justification comes aboundingly from God. He thunders his decree that we are justified. When you get to heaven and you go to God and say, God, can I, can you show me the legal manuscript wherein my justification, the decree of my justification is found God, as it were, could take you to those record books and open it up where the declaration of you being righteous and forgiven is there and it will have exclamation points on it. God doesn't whisper this decree. It's not something that comes out of his mouth begrudgingly and he doesn't leave you to guess about it. He thunders this. There are exclamation points all over the manuscript in heaven of your justification. God is pleasured to forgive. He is pleasured to declare righteous and to now think this way about those that have confessed their sins and believed in Jesus. 
Now here's the deal. This definition I just gave you prior to 15 years ago, I think I would have totally agreed with this definition. I would have defended it. But the problem was, is I sort of viewed this as some sort of legal technicality and that it didn't have a lot of direct bearing on how God went about relating to me. Um, I don't know why I had a problem with that, but it was almost like on my bad days, I would, I would almost imagine God saying to me, uh, looking at me and saying to me, yeah, Milton, technically you're justified, but I'm angry with you for the way that you have behaved today. I am wrathful against you, even though technically you're justified. And so I didn't understand the way that my justification actually affected that notion right there. And so I want to add one element to Grudem's definition that I know he would totally agree with. And that is this, guys, that God doesn't just decide and declare that he will always think of us as forgiven and as righteous, but God then binds himself. He binds himself to this decision and this decree. And he says, this decree that I am now making, that you are righteous and you are forgiven, I want you to know that I will make myself forever governed by this decision. At all times, on your good days and bad days, I will always be governed and bound by this decree that I have made about you. And God says, I will never think another thought about you ever that is not governed by this decision and this decree. I will never allow myself to feel another feeling regarding you that is not limited and shaped by this decision that I am making. I will never, as your sovereign Lord, allow anything into your life or do anything to you or ever show you any countenance that is not controlled and shaped by this decision and this decree that I am making about you today. It's almost like good days and bad days, you can come into God's presence and every time you come into his presence, he's reading something. And he looks up as you come into his throne room and he's, he's, he welcomes you and he says, I was just reading the transcripts of your justification. Come on in. What can I do for you? What do you need from, from me? God is saying, I justified you, but I never take that decree and declaration and put it on a shelf somewhere and forget about it. It is always front and center in my consciousness on your good days and on your bad days. You may say, but what about when I sin? What about when I disobey God? Does God favor me? Does he still think about me this way? Am I still under his gracious favor? And my answer is what? Yes, absolutely. God still views you in this way, even on your worst days. In fact, God, because you are justified on your bad days, when you sin, God loves and favors you so much that he will send the spirit's conviction into your heart and he may send discipline into your life in order to wean you off of that sin and to make you a deeper participant in his holiness. But when he disciplines you, it's not out of wrath. It's not out of anger and hostility against you. When he disciplines you, he does so because he is for you and he loves you and he disciplines you for your ultimate good. And he does that because he has justified you and decided to always think about you as forgiven and as righteous with the righteousness of Jesus. This all comes to us through Jesus. Look at Romans 5, 9, having now been justified by his blood, not our blood, not by our performance, but by his blood, the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Romans 5.18 in your notes. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. What is that one act of righteousness? Is it something you did? Is that one thing you did in your life? No, it's the one act of righteousness of Jesus in giving himself over in death on the cross. 
And by the way, his entire righteous life is wrapped up in that one act of righteousness. The entire life of Jesus culminating in his death on the cross is one single act of righteousness. You know why I know that? Because if Jesus died on the cross and yet one time when he was 11 years old committed a sin, his death on the cross would have no atoning value. All of his life of righteousness culminated in his death on the cross to make it of atoning value and significance for us. It's through his act of righteousness. Preach that to yourself. It's not your righteousness. It's his that results in your justification. It's all Jesus 100%. It's not, you know, 99% Jesus and 1% you. It's not 99% the performance of Jesus, but you got to contribute something. 1% maybe. Think about it. If God said it's 99% Jesus and 1% you, you know what would happen? For all of eternity in heaven, you and I would be bragging about our 1%. Right? We would be tireless bores in heaven talking about our 1% and what we did, and we wouldn't be talking about the 99% that Jesus did. That's why God designed the gospel in such a way to where it is all Jesus and none of us to strip us of our pride and to get us to trust him and him alone. And by the way, if you or if someone you know, and this is the way so many people in the world think, they, they want God to think of them as righteous or at least righteous enough to get into heaven, right? But they don't go to God to find out how to get him to think that way about them. They come up with their own idea. It's like, well, I'll do this and this and this and abstain from this and this and this. And I'll be better than at least 50% of the people in the world. And therefore, God will look at me when I die and stand before him and declare me to at least be righteous enough to get into heaven. Right? And such people kind of hope that as they stand in line to come before God for him to make his decision about them, they sort of hope that the people in front of them are really, really bad to where they look really good when they stand before God in comparison to those that were before them. But I would just say this, and you can share this with people that you're ministering to, that if you think that you're going to impress God with your own personal righteousness when you stand before him at the judgment, you need to get to know something about the righteousness of the person who was in line in front of you. The righteousness that God has been staring at for the last 2000 years. And that's Jesus and his righteousness, which is absolutely perfect. Jesus ruins it for you. If you think you're going to be righteous enough to commend yourself to God, when you stand before him at the judgment, Jesus slaughtered that. Because God has been staring at his perfect, spotless righteousness for 2,000 years. And then you're going to waltz in there and impress him with the few good things you did. Helping the old lady across the street. Giving 2% to charity. The fact that you've lied, but not that much. You've committed adultery in your heart, but not that much. Our righteousness is not going to be sufficient at the judgment. It is Christ's righteousness. And for those of us that have believed in Jesus... God says to us, I will always think about you as forgiven and I will always think about you as clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Romans 4, 5, he was raised for our justification and 4, 25, Christ was raised for our justification. And you may say, well, how is it that he died so that we would be justified and he was raised for us to be justified. Think about it this way. His death on the cross was the purchase for our justification. His resurrection was the receipt. The receipt. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, think about it. If Christ died and his death was not sufficient to atone for every sin you've committed, maybe there's one sin that his death did not atone for, guess what? Jesus would still be in the tomb today. The fact that he's raised from the dead was God's statement that the death of Jesus Christ is totally sufficient to atone for every sin you ever have or will commit throughout your lifetime. And so the resurrection of Christ is your receipt. Keep that receipt and speak that to your conscience. Show that receipt to your conscience when your conscience may condemn you. 
uh, salvation and justification comes through faith in Christ and through him alone. Let's look at truth number three, and we'll go more quickly through these next ones. This justification that we're talking about brings us into a relationship with God that is characterized by peace, by peace. Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You might want to mark the word with um, and whatever the Albanian equivalent of that word is. In other words, we now have a relationship with God that is characterized by withness relationship. In fact, the Greek word uh, that is translated with here is the word pros, which literally means toward. Literally, we have peace toward God. In John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was toward God. Speaking of relationship, movement toward the Father, in intimacy with the Father, we are now described in the same way. That we have peace toward God. Instead of running away from God in rebellion against him, God has halted our flight and he has turned us to himself. And we now have peace with God. We have a relationship with God that is characterized by towardness with him and by peace. You know what the word peace means. It speaks of more than the absence of hostility. It speaks of the luxurious presence of all that is needed for a rich and vital and close and warm relationship with God. It speaks of friendship with God. And so now we see that while our justification is technically legal, it was done with a profoundly relational intention by God. God justified us in order to get the sin problem stuff taken care of so that he can then bring us into close relationship and friendship with himself. One commentator, Cranfield, that's in your notes, says this, God does not confer the status of righteousness upon us without at the same time giving himself to us in friendship and establishing peace between himself and and us. And I ask you, do you believe this? Let's stop for a second. Let me just ask you, do you believe this? Do you believe that you're justified? And if you believe that you're justified, do you believe that God justified you not as an end in itself, but to achieve the greater end of bringing you into close, intimate friendship with himself? Do you believe that God wants a close, warm, vital friendship and relationship between you and him. I remember years ago, I, as a pastor, I was talking to a man in our church who had known the Lord for nine years, and I know how long he had known the Lord because I had had the privilege of leading him to Christ nine years earlier. But um, I noticed that he had seemed discouraged lately, and I was meeting with him one morning, and before he left our meeting, I just asked him, I said, brother, are you enjoying a close relationship with God? Are you walking in intimacy with God? And he looked at me and here's his reply. He said, oh, Milton, you have no idea the things that I did before I was saved. That was his answer. And you know what he was revealing by that? What he was revealing was, you know what? I believe, Milton, that I'm a Christian and I believe God has saved me and forgiven me. But God does not want a close relationship with me. Not after all that I've done, especially before I was saved. This brother would be totally happy to have died and gone to heaven and lived in in the suburbs of heaven somewhere. Where God says, listen, I'll save you and forgive you and I'll make you my child, but I don't want any relationship with you and I'll let you into heaven, but it'll be in the distant corner of heaven. This brother would have been, that's cool with me. I'm fine with that. That's so much more than I deserve. But the message of the gospel is that God wants more than that. God justified you with a profoundly relational intent to bring you into close, intimate friendship with himself, regardless of what you've done. Think about Paul. 
Paul was a violent aggressor, a blasphemer. He tried to get Christians to blaspheme the name of Jesus. Uh, you can't get worse than that. And, and yet Paul lived in a close relationship with God. And there may have been people who tried to shame him out of that. But he's like, I'm not ashamed to believe this is true for me and to preach it to other people. This justification that we've received through Christ brings us into a relationship with God that is characterized by peace. Look at truth number four. This justification also brings us into the permanent and unalterable experience of God's grace. Of God's grace. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction. And that that means entry, our entrance by faith into this grace in which we stand or in which we have taken our stand. Paul is saying right now we are inside of grace because we've been justified. Now, when you see the word grace in the New Testament, Uh, Think of three things, and I believe this is in your notes. First of all, think of the word favor. Favor from God and all of the blessings and the privileges that God bestows upon us as he does good to us uh, as a manifestation of that favor. So it's the favor of God. But then secondly, think of the word undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. In other words, you didn't earn it. Get over it. This grace and all the benefits of it that you now have, you didn't earn it. It's undeserved. So imagine that you're employed by an employer and you don't go to work on a given week. You don't do any work. You just stay home and do other stuff. And at the end of the week, you call your employer and you say to him, I would like a paycheck for working this past week. Now imagine that your boss says, okay, I'll write you a check as if you worked over this past week. That would be grace, right? He's giving you something you failed to deserve. That is grace, but guys, that only gets us half of the distance to grace. So you not only have to think of the word favor and undeserved, but also thirdly, ill-deserved favor. Ill-deserved favor. Meaning this favor is not just something you failed to earn and deserve. It's actually the opposite of what you have, in fact, earned. So imagine you don't go into work for a week, so you don't earn a paycheck. But during that week, you show up at your place of employment and you commit a crime and you set the business on fire, destroying the business and the... Your boss's only son happened to be in the building and he was killed in that fire. Now, what do you deserve? You deserve to go to prison for the crime that you've committed. But imagine after committing that crime that cost the life of your boss's son, you then call him up and have the audacity to say, I would like a paycheck as if I worked over this past week. Now, imagine that your boss said, you know what? I'm going to write you a paycheck as if you worked this past week. That's biblical grace. It is favor from God. It is something we have failed to earn. And it is something that is, in fact, the opposite of what we have earned. And that is God's judgment. And Paul says... Because we have been justified by faith, we have been brought into relationship with God that is characterized by peace, and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, we have obtained our entry by faith into this grace in which we stand. This favor from God that is undeserved and ill-deserved. Paul calls all of this a grace, a grace. Notice that Paul uses the word grace all the time in his letters to Christians. And I want you to feel this. Imagine that you're in God's presence and you're enjoying this peace with God, relationship with God, this forgiveness and justification uh, through Christ and 
you're enjoying that and Paul taps you on the shoulder and he says, hey, don't forget, this is a grace. And you realize, wait a minute, and he says, you realize you don't deserve this, right? Well, yeah, I realize that. You realize this is the opposite of what you deserve, right? Yeah, I realize that. Thanks, Paul, for reminding me. And then imagine every day Paul keeps coming to you saying, hey, you realize this is grace, don't you? You realize this is the opposite of what you deserve, right? We actually see him doing this to the Ephesian Christians in Ephesians 2. Paul is enumerating the aspects of their salvation. And then in Ephesians 2, 5, he says, by grace, you've been saved. You guys so don't deserve this. It's the opposite of what you've deserved. And then he continues on. And then again in verse 8, he has to say it again. By grace, you've been saved. And you might hear Paul saying that and throwing up that word grace that actually is kind of offensive to our normal human pride. And you might say, Paul, why do you keep reminding me that this is an undeserved and ill-deserved grace? Why do you keep throwing that up in my face? And Paul would say, I keep reminding you of this because... If you don't get the idea in your head that all of this is an undeserved, ill-deserved grace, then you are never going to be able to enjoy the good of your justification. It is only when you understand that the good of our justification that we're talking about here is all of grace, undeserved and ill-deserved. If we understand that, it will forever cure us of ever thinking that our standing with God has anything to do with our performance at all. It has nothing to do with your performance. It's all about the performance of Jesus. You didn't earn it. It's the opposite of what you have earned. Get over it, accept it, and just enjoy it. Okay? Um, And guys, I'm trying here to deliver you from the cycle that I experienced in my life of going from pride to condemnation. From pride to condemnation again. And again, your salvation is all of grace every day. It's unearned. It's the opposite of what you have earned. If you let that into your head and into your heart, you'll be forever delivered from thinking you have anything to do with it and earning it and then maintaining it. In my Christian life, there were seasons before I really began to understand justification that that I'd be going through a season where I'm doing real well and I'm in the word, I'm praying, I'm standing from besetting sins and pursuing holiness and, and I'm doing really well. And it's almost like the devil would come up to me and say, Hey, Milton, uh, look at you. You're doing so well lately. You're practicing the disciplines, you're in the word, you're praying and you're abstaining from besetting sins and you're doing really well, aren't you? And I would say, yeah. And then the devil would say, you know what, looking around, Milton, you're doing better than most people in the church that you know, aren't you? And I'd look around and say, yeah, actually, I think I'm doing a little better than about anyone else I know. And then the devil whispers in my ear, God must really favor you because you're doing so well. And you know what I would say? I would say, yeah, yeah. And because I bought into the lie in that moment that my favored status with God had anything to do with my performance, you know what happens next. The rug gets pulled out from under me. I have a really bad day. I fail spiritually in a miserable way. And because I bought into the lie that my standing with God had something to do with my own merit, now that I failed to earn it, I felt like I had lost my favored status with God. And so on Monday, I'm feeling proud of myself and smug in my spirituality. And on Tuesday, I'm in the depths of despair and defeat. And in my own journey with the Lord over many years, I would toggle back and forth from pride to condemnation, pride to condemnation, because I didn't understand that it's all of grace, all of grace. I didn't earn it. It's the opposite of what I have earned, and it's mine. 
Now my attitude that I'm growing in, I'm still trying to get this right, is the attitude of Paul where he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And I'm not going to let his grace prove vain in me. Paul's like, I don't deserve to be an apostle. I don't deserve to be a Christian. I don't deserve to have my sins forgiven. But you know what? By his undeserved, ill-deserved grace, I am what I am. And I'm taking it. I'm taking it, even though I know I don't deserve it. And I'm not going to let his grace prove vain in me. Let's go to the fifth and final truth about our justification. And we'll close with this. that This justification is intended to be a cause for daily celebration. Daily celebration. Paul says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now listen to his language. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, we exult in our tribulations. Verse 11, we exult in God. The word that is translated exult there, it basically means to rejoice out loud. Okay? So Paul's like, having been justified by faith and having entered into this grace, we are continuously rejoicing out loud in hope of the glory of God. We are rejoicing out loud in our tribulations and we are rejoicing out loud in God. Having been justified, we are continuously rejoicing regardless of our circumstances in God and in hope of the glory of God. What we observe now is that Paul is not just writing some dry doctrinal fact. We are observing literally a man in worship. This is a man who understands I've been justified and he's like, I am continuously rejoicing in this reality of my justification that has come to me apart from any merit on my part. This word translated exult is, it's the language of worship. Write down this reference, if this is not in your notes, Psalm 3211. Psalm 3211 in the Greek Septuagint, in the Greek, ancient Greek translation of Psalm 3211, uh, it delivers this call to worship. Be glad in the Lord and exult you righteous ones. It's a call to worship. All those who are righteous exult and rejoice out loud. And Paul's attitude is, you know what? I'm a righteous one. I didn't earn it, but it's been given to me by grace. And I'm going to accept this call to worship, not just on Sunday mornings, but every day in my tribulations, good times and bad times, I will live my life continually accepting this call to worship in Psalm 32, 11 for forgiven sinners declared righteous. I will continuously rejoice out loud in God, because I am a justified one. The point that I want to make from this, guys, is don't have the attitude like, okay, my justification is done, God took care of it, now I need to move on to pursue sanctification. And that's the way we tend to think as Christians. I'm justified, so that's taken care of. I'll set that down here, and now I'll try to do sanctification. And Paul would say, don't you dare try to pursue sanctification without... Keeping the reality of your justification before your eyes. Through Paul's example, God is saying to us here, I've justified you. Don't ever move on from this. Take this reality, put it in front of your face, and continually be rejoicing in the good of it. Make your justification an ongoing source of joy for your life as a believer. In fact, I would suggest that the first and most critical element of your sanctification is exulting in your justification. If you're a new believer, old believer, you're trying to get sanctification right, there's a lot of aspects involved in your sanctification, but I would say fundamentally your sanctification begins with you learning to rejoice in your justification. That's the first key element of sanctification. Timothy Keller says it this way. I love this. This is in your notes. When we feed on, remember, and live in accordance with our justification, it, look at the three things here, it mortifies our idols, 
It fills us with an inner joy and a desire to please and resemble our Lord through obedience. Now, I know some of you are going to read that quote and say, oh, I got my list to walk out of here with. I'm going to make these my three goals. I'm going to resolve to mortify my idols. Secondly, I'm going to resolve to be filled with inner joy. If it kills me, I'm going to be filled with inner joy every day. And I am going to, from this point on, be committed to pleasing and resembling the Lord through obedience. Please don't walk out of here with those three goals. Just walk out of here with one goal. Okay? Just make it your goal to feed on, remember, and live in accordance with your justification. And you know what? You will catch these other three things happening in your life as a byproduct of that. Let's say it this way. This is in your notes. Justification is a once and for all occurrence, but a continuous celebration of this once and for all occurrence is one of the keys. It's not the only key, but it's one of the keys to ongoing sanctification. It is while exulting in your justification that you catch yourself being sanctified. It's a mistake. Uh, G.C. Burkhover, the Dutch theologian, Uh, once said that it is a mistake for Christians to say, we know we have imputed righteousness, but now how do we move on to actual righteousness? He says that's a mistake. And Timothy Keller, tied to that quote from Burkhover, says this, we don't move on. Any particular flaw in our actual righteousness stems from a corresponding failure to orient ourselves toward our imputed righteousness. Sanctification happens to the degree that we feed on, to the degree that we feed on or orient ourselves to or have commerce with the pardon, righteousness, and new status we now have in Christ imputed by faith. Guys, learn to do commerce with the reality of your justification. In Romans 5.17, we actually learn that this uh, reality of your gracious justification is literally a treasury from which you draw to reign as a king, to live a lifestyle of reigning as a king. It's not just a fact that's dealt with and set aside. It's to be the treasury box that you keep going back to and rejoicing in. God's grace... And thus have fuel for your sanctification. Again, the commentator G.C. Burkhover says that this is not in your notes, but he says the heart of sanctification is the life that feeds on justification. One Lutheran scholar and theologian says it this way. Sanctification is simply us getting used to our justification. And so, guys, as we've reviewed these things, I hope that that you're more in love with Christ than ever and more amazed by the beauty of the gospel and that you're also left asking yourself, do I really believe this? Do I really believe this? Let me close with this. I several years ago was counseling a married couple and and they were both just uh, they were Christian people, but living in a spirit of condemnation, just sort of beating themselves down and and not having a lot of grace to give to each other. And they, they were just so beaten down, sitting in my office, and they're just confessing their struggle, their discouragement, their condemnation. And I began to actually unpack what we're talking about here, and about God's grace, and about how God sees them as believers in Christ, and, and that it's all of grace. Um, And when I got done basically evangelizing these Christian people, this Christian couple, I said to them, do you believe what I'm saying is true? And the husband looked at me and he says, I don't know if we believe this. And then he said this, he says, this is too good to be true. He says, we're going to have to go home and pray about this. And I said to him, I said, but before you leave, let me ask you one more question. Imagine that what I've said is true. Let's say you go home and you pray about it, you study the scriptures, and you realize that everything I've just said is true. Imagine that all of this really is true. What would you do? And the man began to tear up. 
And with his wife nodding in agreement, he says, if what you've said here is true, I would so love God. I would go crazy for him. And that's the power of the grace of God that we see in the gospel. The gospel is not just for the lost to get them saved. This is a Christian couple who both had a testimony of faith in Christ, had evidences of salvation, but they were woefully under-evangelized. And hearing the gospel declared to them in my office, and they're like, this is too good to be true. And many times we're in that same place. We honestly believe many times that this gospel thing is just too good to be true for me. But if it really is true, like when, when the Lord began to get a hold of my heart and I began to see the reality of my justification, I felt like a kid in a candy store. I was ready to just go crazy for God. My heart was exploding with love for him because of the grace of it all. So the gospel is wonderful news that we need as believers to be speaking to one another and speaking to our own hearts day by day. And my hope is over the course of these sessions to just be able to evangelize you and to minister the gospel to you and to my own heart afresh so that we're strengthened in the grace of God that we find in the gospel and much better position to be able to minister that to uh, to other people. So guys, there are many doctrines inside of our, ju- our salvation. Justification is one of them. And that's just what we focused on tonight. And there's much about justification we could talk about. We just looked at two verses, basically. Romans 5, 1 and 2. And that's a lot of food for us to feed on and be encouraged by. So let me pray for us all and just pray for God's blessing on the coming sessions together. Lord, you're a good God. You've, you've given us a remarkable grace. And we ask your forgiveness, Lord, for the fact that our hearts are so sluggish and disbelieving of the good of these things. Open our hearts, Lord, to believe in the fullness of what you've given to us in Christ and and that it's not based on our performance. It's all because of Jesus and what he's done. And may our eyes be fixed on him and not on us. And may we know that we're justified. If we have believed in you, cried out to you for salvation, that we are justified. We are forgiven. We are clothed with Christ's righteousness. And it is all of grace. And so there's nothing we can do to earn it or to lose it. And may we learn as Christians that a fundamental part of our sanctification is simply learning to believe, stare at, and rejoice in this reality. I pray that for my brothers and sisters that are here, gathered here tonight, and I pray that for myself as well. You're a good God, and we just say to you, we love you and we trust you. And we thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.